joining me this morning. It's really a privilege for me um, to share this meeting as I consider myself still a rookie here at Walsh University, just completing my first full academic year here, and I feel like I'm a student trying to um, instruct um, the teachers this morning, to be honest. Uh, so it is a, a humbling privilege uh, to get to say a few words here this morning on uh, Gaudium and uh, the central meanings of Gaudium, and really just to continue to echo back to all of you uh, a story which you've been telling me uh, throughout this whole year, what it is to serve at Walsh University. Uh, I recall my opening week at Walsh before classes began, I recall um, really what I found to be a, a stirring uh, introduction to the legacy of Walsh by uh, by Britt uh, Cooper, talking about the legacy. Uh, midway through the semester, I remember walking across campus and witnessing an interaction between uh, Ron Scott and one of his students, which was just inspiring to see the pastoral touch he had and, and just the real genuineness of his you know passing conversation with this student. Uh, I remember basically day one being at Walsh and, and Beth uh, wanting to meet with me about uh, service learning and how it really instilled in me a fire uh, for just the great benefits of service learning. I was able to do a sort of service learning course this past spring, and I'm continuing to do one virtually every semester here uh, at Walsh. These are just some of the experiences of my first year um, at Walsh. It has, it's been just a, a real blessing to be part of the legacy here and just to let it uh, soak in uh, to my being. And, and hopefully begin to embody that myself. Uh, so this part of the presentation is entitled Why Gaudium? And it's really trying to make the uh, more meta connections between the meaning of Gaudium, the meaning of the core curriculum at Walsh, the meaning of the mission of Walsh University, and the meaning of the mission of the Brothers of Christian Instruction. So I'm going to try to take kind of a, a backdoor approach to this by first asking the question, what would you say really unites us as uh, staff and, and faculty at Walsh University? What is um, the common ground that we all orbit around? Um, what are we all passionate about at Walsh University? Uh, Carolyn spoke of the educational culture of unity. What unites us as staff and faculty at Walsh University? I think I can read your minds, but I just wanted to hear it. Um, someone other than me to begin. What are you most passionate about serving here? Yes? I'd say service to others. That's part of our mission and part of who we are as educators people. Service to others and um, Exactly, that's what I was hoping to get at. Um, and, and, and even for us uh, specifically in terms of teaching and learning, who is that population that we might consider all of us to be especially passionate about serving? Students. Students. Yes, so I want to show this, this quick video clip here. It's a, a homemade Walsh uh, University video or in house video, um, you could say that you may have seen before, um, but it has an important message, especially for the end. Don't want to be another number in college? Don't want to get lost in the crowd? At Walsh University, you're not just a number. You're our number one priority. College should be the best years of your life. Our professors know your name and care about your success. Our advisors will be with you every step of the way, from choosing a major to guiding you in your career after college. Because at Walsh, no student goes unnoticed. Make your mark. Discover Walsh University today. So the saying at Walsh University, no student goes unnoticed. And uh, in my experience here this year, I would attest that that is the case. Um, fellow staff members and faculty members that I serve alongside, I see this indeed to be the case. And you all have inspired me very much in, in teaching me what it is uh, to be a servant leader professional. 
professor um, here at Walsh. And so how many of you have heard President Jusong or Dr. Bo talk about the ion theory? Okay, a few, okay. I wanted to bring this up because I think it's quite meaningful uh, to our questions at hand. Um, President Jusong talked about it this way. There's these three words, mission, vision, and passion. They all end in I-O-N. They all have this in common. And so mission is really the anchor of the whole project, of the whole task of the university, that which uh, is permanent and uh, the, the reason for being of the university. Vision is that which is malleable, that which changes and flexible given the signs of the times, given the circumstances um, in the present situation. And passion is the impetus, the driving force of the whole um, work that we're about. And, and uh, so this is what drives the mission, fulfills the mission, and holds to the mission at all costs. Brother Marcel puts it quite well. He says, we do not have a mission. The mission has us. And when I first heard him say that, I thought, right about that. And I thought about Carol Splendori coming to visit the theology division before classes even started in the fall, talking all about assessment. And as a new college professor, I'm here, you know, kind of adjusting my bow tie and thinking, just let me do my theology research and teach my classes. And, you know, um, you know, I was kind of suspicious about it, you know, to be honest. I think, like, many can have that reaction. But after that first meeting and starting to talk about rubrics, and I started to kind of get it, and, you know, Father Manny was uh, showing a rubric he developed for one of his courses that week. You know what? To develop a rubric, that's a good idea. Is that for grading these papers that I've been asking the students to write. And that paid great dividends uh, in my classes. Uh, being swept into a faculty learning community led by Mary Giffen and Alan Gian Antonio uh, has also been tremendous in, in influencing the way I teach. I'm teaching a class right now, this first term of the summer, when uh, I'm integrating double entry journals and concept mapping and all these things to promote. Uh, deep reading. Uh, also, just remembering um, Brother Joe, um, who would sit on the side of Lamine, and anyone who walked by, as he was sitting out there, he'd call out and he'd say, Hey, and he'd call people by their name. You know, hey, Janet, how are you doing? You know, and people would come and spend some time visiting. And I felt very privileged to have some, some nice conversations with him there on the side of Lamine before he went down to be with the Lord. Uh, again, being swept up into Gen Ed Committee uh, and participated in this experience, which this meeting is, is all about. Uh, thinking of Terrence Portis and his loving and pastoral touch uh, with the Academic Support Center. All these various examples allows this mission to take on flesh. All these examples attest to the fact that the mission has us here at Walsh University. It confronts us, it provokes us, it sweeps us into uh, it's meaning. So the key question I want to ask them, this being said, is how does this document on the table, God in his face, which is Latin for the just opening words of the document, the joys and the hopes, how does this document coincide with the mission of Walsh University and what can we call the Manasian charism after Jean-Marie de Lamine, uh, one of the founders of the Brothers of Christian Instruction, which is what can we call the Manasian charism, or well, that is the peculiar and unique gifts of this religious order and what makes it, it tick. This is a question about to pursue very quickly. So here's a picture of Jean-Louis Robert de Lamennais, uh, one of the founders of the Brothers of Christian Instruction, founded in 1819, Brittany, France, the other co-founder, Gabriel de Hay. Um, they founded this um, community I've heard from many of you already with the express, express mission to educate the children of working class families. Uh, those living in poverty who didn't have the opportunity of education, they became a source of education for them. Basic fundamental human rights is a matter of justice to uh, be entitled to education, to uh, holistic education. The core of the mission statement of the Notre Dame province of the brothers, that is the brothers uh, of the United States, says this, we pledge to strive above all else to proclaim Jesus Christ and his 
his gospel. To proclaim Jesus Christ and his gospel. This is at the heart of it all. This is the reason uh, Walsh exists. Uh, and it's an extension of his mission to make Jesus Christ known uh, in terms of inviting Christ, his message, his life, his being, all the testimonies surrounding him, the testimony of the church, to enter into conversation around the problems and challenges of our times. What wisdom gives itself? What tradition? What legacy? What examples? What it is to be a human being, to be a woman, to be a man, to promote the dignity of others. So the way this religious community evolved, it became a missionary kind of order, even though it wasn't founded with this intention. Over time, the brothers extended their ministry throughout the globe, and now today are serving in, in all the major continents in Asia and Africa, in South America and North America, in Europe, throughout the world, are serving people with the same mission by which it was founded. The Manasian charism can be spoken of having six marks. And actually, Brother Guy presented these a couple years ago at this very same meeting, and I couldn't help but desire to echo these once again, as they're so inspiring uh, for me, and I, and I know for so many of you. The first, evangelization, which has already been said, to make Jesus Christ and his gospel known, to allow it to enter into conversation. Second, servant leadership. To lead by serving others, to be at the service of others. And that is what it means to be a leader. To teach means to be a model of Christian living, not to contradict at least the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Carolyn talked about uh, students uh, to form a moral identity at Walsh University. We're concerned about values based education, that students would form a moral identity that they would have ownership of. This has to be modeled by their teachers. Fourth, the trust in divine providence, the inscription on the exterior of Our Lady of Perpetual Health Chapel said, Deus dat incrementum, but God gives the increase. This fundamental trust that all the teaching, all the different methods of teaching, all that we do with the students, that ultimately is the spirit of God at work in the intimate recesses of students' minds and hearts that will bring about the transformation that is the goal of all education. Fifth, as I mentioned before, to teach the children the working class, this is a matter of justice, a goal of social justice, to make sure this education is there for all. And lastly, to educate the whole person. It's not a reductionistic uh, theory of pedagogy, but it's one that is, that is holistic. And this echoes um, Dr. Baxter's presentation as well, that um, beginning with the end in mind, thinking about the whole person, not just to equip someone to get a job, um, to earn a nice uh, paycheck, these kinds of things, which are important, but to educate the whole person um, is the greatest service to the student. All these marks are echoed in the mission statement Walsh University, which is the anchor of every task on campus and beyond. Um, you see the Catholic identity, you see it linked to the particular uh, charism of the Brothers of Christian Instruction, educating students to become leaders in service. This idea of servant leadership is integral. A values-based education, international perspective, the missionary charism of the, the Brothers coming through in the pedagogy, in the methodology, and all taking place within the Judeo-Christian tradition. The second half of the mission statement, um, the intimate close student-teacher interactions we saw in the video, uh, that uh, no student goes unnoticed. All the faculty know students by name, their learning is quick, they see them on campus, call them by name, they care about what's going on in the class. Very pastoral. You give them uh, the time of day, and in fact, you seek them out uh, to help them to, uh, achieve their maximum potential. Um, you see the education of the whole person in terms of spiritual growth, personal, professional.
professional cultural development um, and uh, that vital relationship then between reason and faith all in a very fervent and fruitful um, dialogue. So all this then being said, it takes us more specifically to Gaudium. How does Gaudium resonate with this underlying mission that is found in the brothers, that is found in Walsh? Um, what is its central meaning? Very quickly, take a look at this. It's responding to the dilemmas of the modern world. Gaudium and Spes, you could say, gives a diagnosis of the modern world, looking for the document. It claims to have its finger on the pulse of the modern world. Another working title of the document is called the Pastoral Constitution of the Church in the Modern World. There's another constitution of the Church that came through Vatican II. It's called the Dogmatic Constitution, Lumen Gentium. This is the Pastoral Constitution, so it's very consciously pastoral in its approach to all these questions. It's an unprecedented document in terms of length, in terms of content, in terms of uh, attitude and approach. Uh, it's sui generis, it's one of a kind this Gaudium et Spes, and rightfully uh, the flagship sort of document uh, to serve as a guidepost for the curriculum. Evangelization, again, is at the heart of this document, making Jesus Christ and his gospel known. How does it propose to do this? Is it kind of um, a siege mentality of the church? Is it kind of a sort of colonialism, sort of um, coercion of accepting the gospel? No, it's a different approach. It's quite a different approach that's based on two key terms. First of all, dialogue. People in conversation. Conversation about proposals, about claims, about ideas, about arguments. What is most adequate? What in the end is most credible, most relevant? Thinking of it this way as a picture of like the church in the throes of modernity where you have these um, high-rise buildings, uh, information surge, technology surge, in the wake of the developments of uh, evolutionary concept of nature and the promise of progress, rapid social change, and yet imbalance. Numbers of people falling away from the practice of religion. How does the church seek to enter into dialogue with these social phenomena taking place across the globe? The second key word along with dialogue is solidarity. And this term is evinced in the very opening of the document. You can read it in the yellow booklet, which presents the whole document. It starts out this way. God met spends the joys and hopes, the grief and anguish of the people of our time, especially of those who are poor or afflicted. Think of the mission of the brothers. Are the joys and hopes the grief and anguish of the followers of Christ as well. Nothing that is genuinely human fails to find an echo in their hearts. For theirs is a community of people united in Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit in their pilgrimage towards the Father's kingdom, bearers of the message of salvation for all humanity. Message of salvation for all humanity a universal claim. That is why they cherish a feeling of deep solidarity with the human race and its history. This gets at this idea of solidarity. Moreover, this document, God and Spes, and this whole Second Vatican Council is about trying to detect and responsibly interpret the signs of the times of modernity in the light of the gospel and does this if it is to carry out this task, its reason for being as the church, reading the signs of the times. Is this not what we do at Walsh and all our various workspaces in the classroom and beyond, interpreting the signs of the times of the students, trying to adapt ourselves to these signs for the most effective education to take place? One of these, say today, is a phenomenon, a digital explosion the World Wide Web, social networking, such as Facebook. This is a world map depicting how the world is digitally connected. We're at a time in history that's unlike any other. 
in this respect. And God in his fed speaks to these kind of rapid social uh, phenomena of progress, of change. Two key quotes from the document I just can't help but single out, which in studying Catholic theology, uh, in my view, these two quotes embody, signify the entire document. Um, their potency. The document, of course, is focused on the human person and human dignity. Human beings created in the image and likeness of God. The human person is the one who is responsible for all. This is what it is to be human. Not to see oneself, to advocate for one's rights alone, a sense of entitlement, but to recognize the inviolable rights of others and to come to one's brother's and sister's aid at all times. So the human person is counts of use. The only creature on earth which God will for itself cannot fully find him or herself except through a sincere gift of him or herself. To become a gift of self. What is it to become a gift of self? In light of the gospel, in light of the, the life of Christ who said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for the many. The second quote, paragraph 22, along these lines, in reality, counsel holds, it is only the mystery of the Word made flesh, that is, the Son of God, become flesh in Jesus of Nazareth through Mary, that the mystery of humanity truly becomes clear. In the life of Christ, in the life of Mary, all the saints, is revealed what it is to become a gift of self. The question, does this truly serve humanity? Does it truly humanize humanity? Does it elevate the dignity of the human being and the entire human family? These are key quotes from the Council, which I think really sums up the entire document. And um, I'm sure that we're going to get a chance to have a conversation now about the document, how we all use it in our various fields of study and work. Um, I want to end with a quote um, from the uh, undergraduate catalog, actually speaking about the Heritage Series courses. Um, it says, under Heritage 1, I was asking, where are we? The challenges of the present. Asking about the challenges of the present. It claims that a full understanding of any issue is not complete without considering multiple perspectives, including those embodied in Gaudium and Spence. And so I hope that this presentation has just uh, been simply another source of encouragement for our uh, collective task of considering uh, the personal message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, especially articulated in God and Spes, as it seeks to respond in relative fashion, uh, relevant fashion, to the problems and challenges of our time. And I hope that this will encourage us all to continue, and even more so, engage Gaudium as a conversation partner in our various respective disciplines of study and of work here at Walsh, uh, and to um, openly and seriously consider the proposals therein, to wrestle with them, and to invite our students to wrestle with them, and to find in the end where truth shows itself and with the goal of building one another up, of serving one another in love. So thank you very much. I look forward to a continued conversation.